What is it that makes some games capable of emotionally breaking the player? How do you create those powerful moments that make the player go, God I love this game? The Nier entries are an interesting case study for these questions, since they use both conventional and unusual techniques to create an emotionally resonant experience. Series creator Yoko Taro gives a lot of presentations on how he develops his games. This video will condense those and focus on what his process for creating strong emotional responses looks like. Some variation of all the techniques I'll discuss can be seen in other games, but Taro prioritizes things differently, and there are some aspects that are very unique to his style. He's a unique guy after all. Taro's top priority when making a game isn't the story or gameplay, it's to evoke an emotion in the player. That's not to say story and gameplay aren't important to him, it's just that the main result he's looking for isn't even in the game itself. He's trying to make something he can't even see in the player's mind, which actually explains a lot, especially about Drakengard. Gameplay. To put it simply, in order to get a player to feel something, you need to create an emotional peak, some moment in the story that's designed to evoke a strong emotional response. If you look at a story as a sequence of events like this, an emotional peak occurs somewhere here. Whatever the actual scenario is for the peak doesn't have to be complicated. A character's death is a pretty common example. Taro gave two of those himself in past presentations. A girl dies and a man dies. The emotion we've picked is sadness. Now we need reasons to feel sad towards these two situations. Here's what Taro comes up with. Both of these scenarios should sound kind of familiar to Nier fans. I'm going to continue with this one. The way in which you present these details is what separates a well-crafted emotional peak from a weak one. We need to have known this girl for a while for her death to actually feel tragic. So Taro takes these reasons and layers them into the story at different points. The idea here is to mimic real life. Many of the powerful emotional peaks you've experienced yourself are a product of many events that date back far into the past. Similarly, we want more events in terms of both scale and time spent to try and maximize the size of the peak. With this in mind, we can think of the game's story as a set of emotional peaks, each with their own stack of reasons that lead up to them. This is Taro's actual script writing process for both the Drakengard and Nier games. You start with the emotional payoff, then fill in details that would get you to that point. He refers to this as backwards script writing. His next step would be to figure out the details surrounding the actual peak moment. Taro does this by intensely visualizing the scene and putting himself in the moment. He calls his version of this photo thinking. The goal here is to make sure that the factors supporting the sadness we should be feeling are actually present in the scenario. The details Taro presented were these. Killed mid-wedding, stabbed in the stomach, being a person from a different land, different culture. As you've probably noticed, this is an abstraction of Fira's death from Replicant. And perhaps the most important detail, the king is by her side, holding her. And with Fira's last breath, she says, thank you for marrying me. Photo thinking is actually how Taro develops the setting of the game too. From imagining the scene, we also know what the atmosphere in the village is like, what the skies look like, and so on. The world gradually starts to form itself. This whole process is Taro's basic approach to evoking emotion and storytelling. While they might use a different strategy to develop it, most games with a good story can do this. So let's go one level deeper. The crazy thing about video games is that they're interactive. Gameplay further enhances our ability to control the player's emotions. Therefore, one of the most common examples of manipulating the player's emotions would be to get them to want to kill the enemy. Taro's example is kill the enemy to protect the village. And these are some of the reasons he's given for why you'd want to do that. Note that these are not just told to you, they're things you figure out as you interact with the world and progress through quests. But on top of that, it's also important that you have many different reasons. Since there are a variety of people playing a game, themes need to be presented from different angles in order to get the response you're looking for. A really simple example Taro uses for how this can go wrong is a picture of some kittens. You might think they're cute, but if you're severely allergic to them, you might be a little afraid. Now, if we toss this caption below the image, the atmosphere is very different. You might feel sad now, sad enough to want to avenge them. There's an impressive use of this manipulation tactic in Near Replicant. It has to do with the repetitive peaks of guilt that are inflicted in Act 2 of the game. As the player collects the key fragments, we slowly go from this mindset of kill the enemy to should I be killing the enemy? Just scenario after scenario of making the player feel bad. Cry. This loop we find ourselves in also makes use of what might be one of the most misunderstood aspects of gaming, freedom. 
So gaming went through this phenomenon of open world fatigue in the mid to late 2010s. A lot of open world games were released, all characterized by their large maps, tons of side quests and hidden items, and the ability to go anywhere from very early in the game. But players started to get tired of these over time, and we somehow ended up in a situation where people were complaining about a high level of freedom. Taro's conclusion is that once these staples of open world games became the norm, people started to think of things like doing side quests as chores. To him, a high level of in-game freedom does not equate to the player feeling free. He suggests that the way we should interpret freedom is as a future that you did not have in the past. In other words, you feel free when you're able to do things or perceive things in a way that you couldn't before. The way this is done in Nier is by taking the world and making it seem smaller than it really is, both in terms of physical area and the amount of information you have. Replicant is structured in a way where you end up playing through each area at least three times. You'll visit the main areas once as a kid, then again once the player character is older, but this time you have some additional endgame areas you've never seen before. The third round is a replay of the post time skip section of the game, but this time we can see and hear what the enemies are thinking, and gain a better understanding of what this world really is. The player also gets this false impression that the game is over after ending A, when there's still more to go. I won't go into ending C, D, E, but same idea. Nier Automata does a similar thing, but this time you play as a different character in Route B. Then C is a totally different scenario despite using the same levels, but the world still opens up a bit overall. Haro's idea of freedom and the conventional open world idea of freedom are one and the same, if we just go by definition. It's just that the way they're presented feels different. Rather than seeing it as I have so many choices, it's more like I am no longer burdened. The game's chains have come off, the wall has been broken, some Aaron Yeager level freedom type thing. We can go one level deeper. Emotional peaks and manipulations can be further extended by using real world context. Things like social issues from our world being present in games, and playing with real people from all over the world. But it's rare to come across something that directly interferes with the player's real life experience playing the game. Like when Omori purposely glitches and quits the game on you, when DDLC has you go through and manipulate the game's files, when a character dies of old age in Metal Gear Solid 3 when you wait a week of real life time. Taro's spin on this idea started with this. The player is likely to frequent replicant submenus throughout their entire playthrough, perfect for an emotional peak. His goal is to try and make the player feel something about menus. I'm going to talk about endgame spoilers for Replicant and Automata now, so skip to this point if you need to. Taro used the idea of a player's save data being erased as the emotional peak, employed backward script writing to stack reasons for this, then used photo thinking to visualize the exact experience of a player watching this happen. In Replicant's version of this, you're faced with a choice of deleting your save data in order to save Kaine. The game gives you enough reasons to care about this character, and you yourself have so many hours put into the game as a reason to keep your save. There is a real cost to this decision. Nier Automata pushes the real world interaction element further with a slightly different choice. Either delete their save data in order to help another player in the real world, or don't and help no one. Not to mention, you just got help from strangers moments ago yourself and fought the game's staff in the form of credits. Taro didn't know what the player would think when presented with his choice, and he claims that he wasn't trying to manipulate you into one or the other, though he did secretly hope that the player would take a moment to think about a stranger in a distant country when confronted with this. Taro has formalized this idea of stepping into a realm where games have yet to go with the following illustration. There's a domain dubbed the potential of games, and then there's the things you can't do with games outside of that. We also have this grey area for things we're not yet sure are possible with games. There's an invisible wall here that separates the two. Someone once told Taro that Automata's ending took a step into that grey zone, but he disagrees. He is convinced that taking steps into the zone would present ways to create bigger and more creative emotional peaks that no one ever has. And that's what his long term career goal has been. If the goal of a game is to make a player feel something significant, I think the industry as a whole has to try pushing into that grey zone. Every time you see that injured character trope in a game, it becomes a little less effective at evoking emotion, right? Games should ideally be using all the techniques discussed here. If you're able to take influence from a lot of places and think properly about how to tie them to the context, then you'll be able to control the emotions of the player. And that just might be the ultimate way to make a player say, God I love this game, cause the feeling doesn't have to be positive.